one more step behind the scenes of part three, this is post-production. Uh, now, there are actually lots of components when it comes to post-production, making something after all the footage is uh, recorded. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this up into three parts. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the video in multiple passes. And each pass, we're gonna talk about a different aspect of post-production. And uh, hopefully with each subsequent pass, we're gonna go deeper and deeper into the stuff that you might not have noticed when you first watched it one more step. Okay, part one is going to be framing, cutting, transitions. Part two is going to be all the audio, the music, the sound effects. Uh, part three is going to be all like this computer generated stuff, the CGI, the color, all that kind of stuff. Uh, here we go. Part one, framing and cutting. And uh, so this is like the most prominent thing that you would probably notice. And um, one of the first things that, that you'll notice is that um, when I was editing here, I bunched together a bunch of the stuff that we did together. So if, if you watch part two, you would know that uh, because I shot these like at various times, um, I had a lot of time in between to do uh, to edit the pieces together. And so while I was thinking of like what I was shooting on that day, so that they, they all kind of like fit and flow together and have the kind of same motion kind of match cut it through. Uh, yeah, try, just trying to match cut it throughout. Um, and so you see that, of course, like with here, th these three rapid cut shots. I should probably put a bit of audio of them walking and then this turn and then having that flow into them running and back to them stopping and stuff. So like what, what, what I ended up doing a lot of was um, just having say like filming one day put together back to back to back to back and then I would have like all these chunks in between. And so like if this was the end of one and this was the beginning of the next. So obviously, one of those was filmed with Megan on uh, day zero, I guess. <laughs> and then the other one was filmed uh, with Crystal and Frank downtown. So, so because both of those were disjointed and like not really connected to each other, they were like self-contained in the way that I was thinking of like, okay, well, downtown, go from this to this to this motion. Um, and same thing with at the university. Didn't really cross those two. And so um, we have, uh, and so we had to do kind of like fill in shots at the end, going to the motion of the next. So start running and then going into flowing into the motion of the next shot. Uh, and so th that's just kind of what I did throughout. And I, I could point out various other blocks that we have there. Uh, so from here of them sitting uh, was one block from the university. And then here was a filler shot in between to get them back to uh, running to the bench. So another strategy that I tried to use when editing was this idea of setting up and then paying off. So you set up something first, set up a, like something for the audience to remember, and then later you make that thing uh, somehow important to the story. Um, and in doing so, because there's time in between, then the audience has to like, feels rewarded when they remember, hey, that previous thing that happened that right now is connected to. And uh, so I, I wanted to employ that strategy in uh, the editing. And so this was something I learned a lot with uh, making the grad video of having to set up and then pay off. Uh, if you just show the payoff, which is like the fun part or the, the cool part, the part that really drives the story forward, um, it feels kind of hollow if you just put them back to back to back in a montage because there's just so much happening at once. Uh, but if you slow it down and if you make the audience engaged in watching, engaged in remembering the setup, then uh, it, it becomes much more effective. So the way that I employed that in one more step was trying to set up multiple at once. If they're all within the same kind of block, I would do like setup A, setup B, setup C, and then pay off A, pay off B, pay off C. And so they're back to back to back. And so it's like, if you remember the first one and you remember all the way through, then you're gonna, you're gonna get the payoff for all of them, back to back to back. So here's setup, they're sitting down, downtown, they're drinking water. For this uh, setup, they are sitting down uh, and the guy is pulling out earbuds to listen to music. Here, they're just sitting down both on their phone. Uh, and then payoff, payoff number one, which is here, Crystal drinking water and spilling it and ha having a chuckle. Um, payoff number two is sharing music. Uh, and payoff number three is uh, Megan pushing me and then laughing about it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I actually tried an edit where it just took out all the setups and just had left in all the payoffs and it felt hollow. Although it was faster, it felt hollow and all the interactions seemed had less of an impact. Uh, da, da, da. So yeah, here, match cut. Again, all of these. 
of them facing each other and into which flows nicely into this shot which is the f which is a nice uh, change of pace obviously music changes and everything here because I was able to film crystal first and see also with later on as well so I was able to mirror it and match her blocking as uh, much as possible trying to to show that like back and forth kind of thing okay so trying to keep continuity of movement together here you can see that I am running off to the left and she is running off to the right, both getting prepared. And when it's my turn, I'm done being prepared. I walk in from the right to left. And in that same notion, she is going left to right. Um, so yeah, that you, the continuity of motion, trying to keep that in sync. All these scenes of the bench, probably didn't notice, they're all flipped. They're all, they're all flipped backwards. There was a bunch previously as well that I had to flip. Um, just because I wanted to try and keep, um, I wanted to, to, to try and keep this notion of a progress when they're going from left to right. This shot was originally flipped. If you've been downtown close to the station, you would know, uh, but it's flipped the other way, but I wanted them facing uh, forward. And so I had to flip that. The shot was also flipped. Cause again, I wanted her leaving to going left to right. And the same thing with the peace bridge, left to right. That's also flipped. Uh, and even this bridge, trying to keep that continuity of moving from left to right, that progress going. So again, also this was also flipped. So yeah, for, for all these scenes, they were also flipped. Uh, really all in service of the final moment for this because we wanted her to be running left to right. And there was this nice open area to, to see that she was running, going left to right. In the end, we had to flip absolutely everything. All these shots that go back and forth show uh, Crystal, Crystal running and then me sitting at the bench. So it's that you get to see that back and forth as, as time progresses. But then, is it right here? Uh, to really show like the passage of time, to really show how long the guy was waiting there, had a bunch of these shots back to back. Uh, also, as you can see here in this area, it's a bunch of rapid cuts that go, again, as I said, back and forth from the guy to girl, the guy to girl, the guy to girl, to show how, um, to show the, the, I guess, the anxiousness of it. And then when it hits here, this is just, how long is this? 622. This is solid, solid like 30 seconds where it just goes uncut. Um, it's just one long take to really show that, you know, it's a change of pace, something different. There's contrast to the way that there's cutting to. Again, here with, with all of these shots, I wasn't quite sure how, how Crystal's house would fare in terms of filming. And so uh, I filmed her house first and then I just tried my best to match it. Uh, that made it a lot easier than if I were to film first and then have to go back and try to uh, <laughs> try, try to fix, put her house in, in a way that that might not work. Uh, trying to get that duality of uh, both people. Da, da, da. This is like the lowest low that they're at. And uh, I really wanted to show that by, by having them face each other and have that, uh, that duality. Again, I, I tried to juxtapose. I actually flipped um, myself, the side is flipped. It's because the room's set up that way. Um, <laughs> and, and I wanted to get them facing each other. I wanted to have it be so that um, it's the girl. Again, if you look back at the, the drawing, it's the girl looking backwards because she's not sure. She, uh, she knew that she like ruined this big chance. The guy's still looking forward because he, um, he still, he still is showing that like, he still has hope that their relationship can progress, but he's not quite sure anymore. That's why, and she's sad. So like they're both looking down. Um, and the final moment of the, why is it gone? I don't know why it's gone. Um, the final moment where the, where he turns off the phone, the light turns off to show and everything goes dark just to show that like, that that's kind of like him giving up. And so like, that's a like big impact in terms of a uh, big change in terms of how the rest of the story has, has gone up to then. Uh, back at the locker shot, trying to parallel the beginning and to uh, instead, Instead of now having the, uh, the girl run into the, the guy, it's the guy moving and uh, running into the girl. So yeah, kind of juxtaposing the difference there. That's the end of framing and cutting transitions. Okay. Uh, part two, audio. Everything that you hear in this, uh, besides I think maybe like one or two seconds of it, was external audio. So none of it actually came from when we were on set except for a little bit i'll get to it everything else was recorded separately and or uh <laughs> pieced together 
Okay, so this is all the audio. All, all the green stuff is the audio. And as you can see, there are many, many layers to audio. <laughs> um, of course, let me make this louder now because I'm actually talking about audio. Uh, da, da, da. So this starts off, this opening part. Okay, so first off, the first sound that you hear is, is that locker locking. Um, I didn't actually have a locker. <laughs> and, and so uh, for both this and the later one, you'll see that it's actually not a locker sound. It's like a bunch of metal stuff, like metal doors and stuff closing that I added together. So like, as you can see here, I have layered one, two, three, four, five, I guess, five different audio sounds. So like one, two, three, four, five, and put together, that's what you get. I'll add that in a post. <laughs> um, this is some sound of a crowd walking. And so here you can see all these dots were individually placed footsteps when, uh, when, I was just taking audio of, of footsteps and individually placing them to when, to when their feet hit the ground. Trying to get that. Uh, this and here was some ADRing of, of me wrestling my backpack. And uh, so this entire bottom row right here, this entire bottom row is me and Shirin voice acting. Thank you, Shirin, for doing this uh, and, and sitting in front of a laptop making weird sounds with me for <laughs> for like 45 minutes. Um, you know, let, let me let me add just like a little clip of that here. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I, there you go. It was fun. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, it's going th through that. So, this is, so that entire bottom thing of, of uh, the entire bottom row is just ADR and, or automatic dialogue replacement by me and Sharon. And as, and as you can see, even though this, this isn't real life, the crowd the music drops down as the hit happens and then spikes back up when they're kind of like over to really show like how isolated they are in that moment with one another. Everything else just goes silent. Oh. <laughs> this is more matching of, of sneakers walking on stuff. Uh, da -da. All of this was just matching up sneaker sounds and walking sounds uh, to, to the actual footsteps. Some more walking sound. Da -da. I added <laughs> some like background ambient sounds. <laughs> and here, so because the climax of one more step had to do a lot with uh, the phone and texting stuff, I wanted to introduce that very early. So here we have um, sound of the power button, very very subtle, <laughs> and the sound of like texting, so like button presses. <laughs> also pretty subtle. But just to get that flowing so that later on when you see them texting and you hear the sounds, hopefully it will uh, bring back like, the memory of, of previously that was also there as well. This for uh, every shoe scuff, every shoe like scuffing on concrete, that was recorded <laughs> after the fact. So like, that right there of her spinning and the scuffing of her shoe on concrete, that was all fake. But I do think adding it added a lot more to the actual film, uh, making it seem a lot more realistic. Silent. Walking. Again, shoe scuffing. That was all me pulling the phone down to the ground while I scuffed my shoes. <laughs> no, uh, bags. Uh, a very subtle, quiet car driving by. There is a car. So. Oh, and so like I said before about um, the paying off, a lot of payoffs came in, in the form of like just laughing, just hanging out, just getting uh, to know each other as friends. And so, um, all, all, all that subtle like laughter and chuckling, that uh, ADR, that was ADR in. It wasn't dialogue, it was like dialogue. <laughs> but all the chuckling and stuff that we ADR'd in um, added to the, I guess, the feel of the camera. Even without words. The climax of the scene has a lot to do with phones, so getting the notification sounds, texting. If you're actually to pay attention, those are two different sounds. One of them is from an Android, one of them is from an iPhone. And so you get you get the two different back and forths again here. And so again, um, 
So because there is that transition between the two different settings, I had to have um, two different audio segments. So one of them, I, so this one where it's girl car, as you can see, goes up and falls back down, up and down, up and down in line with when she's in the car. And those are all uh, like ambient noises inside cars as they drive and brake and whatnot. And then in between is, uh, between like here is like, uh, sounds of the bench of uh, like birds chirping and stuff. Uh, again, <laughs> again, very subtle stuff like the rustling of the plastic of the flowers uh, had to add in manually. Okay, here's what I was talking about. This, this right here, this, this little band right here is the only audio that we shot in camera. That's because I could not for some reason, find good high heel stepping sounds. Um, and I don't want to go record anymore. So I just grabbed, grabbed what we had, put it in. Of uh, Crystal, that's Crystal and Frank walking by the camera. Uh, vacation sound. And as you, and uh, add in some car horns and stuff to get realism of like, oh, they're in a traffic jam. And so this sound, of turning off the phone, that reappears over and over and over again every time basically that he checks his phone. Visual, to give you that audio context of when he's turning on and off his phone. Um, clicking on the phone, clicking off the phone uh, to show that like, he's desperate. It's the end, it's, it's kind of like the end of that sequence and the audio starts kicking back in. So we get um, all this of grabbing, of grabbing the suit jacket, hitting the plastic of the flowers, getting up, rustling the flowers again, and then the music kicks over again, there's no more sound, it's silent. So like the, the, the sound really shows you like when you should be paying attention to the stuff that's going on. Uh, all this is just silent because it's sad and, and you know, whatnot. So you just hear the music in until this final part where you hear Shrin crying. there and the only other sound that you hear is right at the end is that power button click and then it goes dark um, so again it, you, you get that notion so because that that was set up so much previously before the power button click it's hoping that right at the end that when you hear the power button that when you hear it along with the screen going dark you know that power button was clicked and uh, that was him just, like giving up uh, da, da, da. Yeah, that right there. Bag drop. <laughs> Big. Um. And then this was just layered multiple sounds of like hitting something, like hitting something with cloth. So then there's a, yeah, lots of layered sound. So again, it's just layering all these sounds that alone might sound kind of weird and not like out of place, but together they sound more realistic. And uh, yeah, the hugging, again, layered sounds. Very much just the same way as before. Oh, okay. So as you may be able to tell, music plays a really big role in film, uh, and especially so in a film where there's no talking. And so I, I heavily relied on good music to make this work. Uh, and so these two, two of these pieces, Beneath the Moonlight by Aaron Kenny and The Bluest Star by The 126ers, uh, I got from uh, the YouTube royalty free music page um, for their creators. But, and, and that and those pieces were here. Oh, oh. <laughs> so here. Uh, beneath the Moonlight was, was kind of like, I guess you could say like the, the, the starring piece. So it's at the beginning, it's at the end, it started their relationship and it ended their and uh, like wrapped up the story of their relationship struggles. I picked it because it's like a very hopeful song. It just shows that their emotions are like changing about one another, which I really like. So we need the moonlight, beginning and end. Uh, and in the middle, most of it was the bluest star. Bluest star. As, as the kind of montage music, very calming, very gentle, but like also like fun kind of music. And uh, 
right here because I, I, I ran out. It was, it was too too long right here. I had to end up like snipping it together. This would be the end of the star, kind of looping it back over on itself once more. Right here. Act two. This is probably the most important, well, what I would say is the most important uh, piece of music in the entire piece. And um, it's a piece of music that I could not have possibly found on YouTube because it is a very specific set of emotions. Uh, I asked Richard if he could help me compose a piece um, that transitions from happy into a very somber and very sad, uh, desperate kind of, uh, uh, kind of emotion. And so this is what he came up with. Uh, it's called it Love's a Fickle Thing. Absolutely loved it. It's beautiful flowing music. As, as they're happy, and then and then because I was able to to talk to Richard, um, I was able, about like how long it had to be and whatnot. Uh, I was able to get it down to, and I was able to cut it in in, in ways that made it so that, like the emotional uh, the emotional roller coaster kind of like tipped off like right when I needed it to, right when the emotion of the story was flipping. And here I had to. It's kind of kind of very somber note. So as the music continues, it brings more tension and some more pace, uh, some more desperation, if you will. And here I, I, I layered it on top of itself. And I really like how it builds up to this to this crescendo. Where I pulled in another part of this piece to just kind of let it sit, that sad. Sadness just kind of sit there for a bit. So yeah, just a somber note. Letting that sit for a bit until I brought back in the final crescendo of her rushing in and, and, and seeing that uh, he's no longer there. Um, yeah, absolutely loved it. Great job, Richard. Yeah, I think it was really able to capture the, the, the sadness of, of, of the moment and the, like, the tension as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, so then it wraps it back up with uh, Beneath the Moonlight to try to wrap everything up in a nice bow. And uh, yeah, that is audio. Okay. <laughs> back to the, to the beginning. Part three of the third part of the behind the scenes. Uh, all the computer generated components. This is all the stuff you probably didn't know I even did. So I'm editing on DaVinci Resolve, and it's known for being a color grading software. Color grading is when you take an image and you mess with the colors in a bit uh, to, to convey a certain type of feeling. So the first step of that is usually color correction. It's when you take the footage and you make it all the same. So then there's no, it doesn't seem to jump back and forth in between shots. So I can show you before and after of everything that I did, basically to every single shot to make it look uh, actually nice. Uh, let me go to color for this. Color tab. Okay, so this is all the stuff I'm working with. There's a lot. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of over overwhelming. Um, but just an initial grade. So on the day I was shooting this, I, for some reason, was not paying that much attention to white balance. And so all of this came up slightly yellow. There we go. Edited it. Gave it more contrast. Made it less yellow. Uh, and, and, and even with stuff like this, just changing the tint, just that little bit makes it all seem more congruent. Uh, and also, because we were shooting this on a rainy day, once rain came, like it was sunny for a bit, and then once rain cover uh, came over, all the outside white light was gone and is replaced with the fluorescent lights at the university. And so it turns out extremely yellow. So we had to try to match this to this as best we could. Okay, so this shot was shot at a bus stop. And if you know bus stops in Calgary, a lot of them are made of glass. And the thing is, here, here's what happens when you put a camera facing towards a piece of glass. You see the camera bright as day. I don't even know how I can do this. You see the camera bright as day, right in smack dab in the middle. It's so obvious, I had to go in and uh, blur it out. And so I just like drew a circle around it, blurred it out. Uh, I just turned that note off, didn't I? Uh, so yeah, all that simple stuff that you might not even notice, uh, it, all, it all adds up. Da, 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 da. 
Okay, so because the intention with this video was to put it into a film festival, I had to own all rights to everything, which means no logos that are trademarked. Uh, which meant I had to go in and blur out or make unrecognizable the Adidas logo on my shirt. And so Megan had the great idea of sticking her hand right in front of it, which meant I had to, instead of just making a mask to track it, I had to make a mask that formed around her hand. Wait, where is it? Is it not here anymore? Where, where normally it would just, it would just sit there and it would just cover up the Adidas, the Adidas logo, blurring it out, whiting it. So then it just looks like the rest of the shirt. Uh, once her hand comes in, I had to go in and manually trace around her hand or around her forearm. This shot, this shot, for some reason, I don't know why I absolutely hated this shot because the color was so off because I was in front of the camera. I could not check the color. The color was so off. It looked so yellow that I was trying to mess around with like how to get this to look more like say this shot, more reds in it. Okay, for this single shot, I went back and forth color grading it like three or four times a day. Leaving, coming back, color grading it again, deleting it, doing it all over again, trying to get it to look uh, somewhat acceptable. Another big thing that happened was Megan's backpack. Every single shot that has Megan's white backpack, this backpack in area here, was such a pain to deal with because here, here's it without, okay, right? It looks yellow, as with all the white stuff, just because, you know, color cast. But when I was color grading it, if it was just this one, it would still look yellow. Color grading everything below it and then like drawing to mask out all the, here it is. Wait, where is it? Here. Here, to mask out all the white in the background, to change that. And so I had to do it individually because if I did it all together, her backpack, which was slightly more blue than the rest of the, the walls, wouldn't turn white. Uh, same, same thing with this one as well, see? Manually, Instead of, instead of this yellow. It's just that slight bit of blue in her backpack uh, compared to everything else that made it such a pain to deal with. Okay, and so all these shots of the bench were basically shot at around the same time. Uh, the sun did set, so as you can see from the beginning shot to, to like the last shot, it did get darker. This is without any color grade on it. Um, it, it, it did absolutely get darker, but uh, it did not get dark fast enough. Uh, and so because we were trying to go with a like afternoon sun is about to set golden hour look, uh, I added a lot more oranges to what was shot here, which was like right in the morning. I think this was like nine o'clock maybe. Um, and match it with something that was shot at like nine o'clock at night, summertime, which means it's still bright outside. It does get progressively from this to this, gets progressively more orange, more yellow, more saturated. And I tried to match that same color with the outside to try to get it to look as best as possible. All this was color graded, right? Right, like, like as I jumped through, th this was shot like basically back to back. There's, there, there, there's no, the, the sun didn't drop that fast. But after color grading it, you go from this to this, to this, to this, to this. And you bring out, bring out the, uh, the, the purples to try to really share, to really show the fact that, that it's, it's nighttime. This is probably the biggest thing that I had to change in post. And um, there's something that was big enough that during my first edit, when I first finished the edit, I was putting it out to people. Um, it's the one that I showed to Shirin when we were doing the voiceover. Um, and uh, it was the one that I showed to Ryan to look over and whatnot. Um, one thing always stood out and it was the problem with the girl's phone. Did she drop the phone? Because she doesn't use it for the rest of the movie. Like if you watch it on YouTube, you wouldn't notice that there's a problem. That's because of all the work that I did post. Here's the original clip that I showed Shirin and Ryan. Uh, it was such a big problem that Ryan brought it up, Shirin brought it up, everyone that I showed it to brought it up. So I knew I had to fix it. Because the way that car seats are sloped, if you try to stand a phone up, it will fall when you move. Um, and problem number two, the Crystal had a big Lululemon bag there, big uh, with a big logo right in your face. The solution came in the form of taking out two birds with one stone. I told Crystal to take a photo of her phone. So what I ended up doing, was I ended up cutting it, repositioning it, cutting it out of that, cutting out the shape of the phone and basically locking it in place wherever placed it right where the Lululemon logo was and for every frame where it would reasonably show up uh, where, where, she, where her legs weren't blocking it, I would go in and I would paste and I would crop out like uh, Crystal's legs or, and, and blur it here, this 
every single frame trying to do that, blurring it, so then to get the motion blur of her legs to get uh, the to get her cell phone in the actual shot. Uh, oh, and also when color grading it, try to make match the same color as everything else. For me, I I I I wasn't quite sure if it worked or not because I was staring at it so much, it looked fake. But I knew when it worked when I showed the people, and the first inst and um, like they commented on saying, "Oh no, she left her phone." clear indication that it worked. People realized that she left her phone in the car. Problem solved. Crisis averted. <laughs> we tried to pop it up like that. That was the original idea, but it would always keep on sliding down. So of course, if you can't do it uh, on set, you gotta fix it in post. Because apparently it was a big enough issue where everyone caught it. I could not have it go uh, leaving my computer like that. Uh, da, da, da. This right here, this cut in between here, there's, there's no actual cut right here. But what I did, was to, to show how dark it was. but uh, So because we were faking darkness, um, things that would show up light, like things that would be bright normally, aren't bright. Uh, and in this is, instance, it was a phone screen. If it was actually that dark, your phone screen would show up a little bit at least. So what I did was I cropped out from one to the next, right when, he, when I hit the power button, I mask in this shape, and I just lighten it, it's just a bit brighter. So like normally it's just this bright, your phone's not gonna show up. But if it was this dark, your phone probably would show up. And so you can barely tell. But that was what it was take, taking, and it was just making it brighter. Um, every single frame, I tried to track the phone as much as best I could. This shot, uh, if you saw the behind the scenes, you would know. Or if you saw the behind the scenes was part two, you would know. This was shot at seven in the morning, <laughs> as in like broad daylight. I tried my best to darken everything up. As you can see right here, everything is squashed right down. I try to match this as, as closely as I can. But some things just don't look right. Obviously like it's bright here because that's the part where the sun is directly hitting. It's out of shadow. I can't really do anything about that at this point. <laughs> um, but what I did try to do was, was darken the ground right here, darken everything underneath just like um, cause if you darken everything else, everything else looks, it looks really fake. If you darken something that's really bright. So I tried to leave that, uh, untouched and just try to darken the ground and darken her. I believe this is darkening. What is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is darkening her, just tracking her and darkening her body itself, trying to still get that aura that, it, that it's nighttime. I tried to match the color as much as possible, but, uh, this was probably the biggest regret that I had not going back and shooting this at nighttime. Okay, so this isn't the final shot. Go see the final shot. This isn't showing up right because I updated something. Um, but th th this is what I had to do. For this final shot, this is actually how bright it was. Because, you know, you want to get as much detail, detail as possible. We had lamps turned on try to, catch, to, to try to get it as bright as possible. But tone wasn't right, so I knew that I could easily stomp everything down, get a real dark. Um, and so the girl's part is, is just very simply just a, just a vignette try to wrap it around her uh, to get it dark and to lighten up her face just, just a tad, um, just, to, just to darken it up, get the right shade so then it's kind of glowing in the middle. Yeah. Uh, for me here, I was also trying, if you watch the actual video, you see it. Um, I tried again that same trick with the, the phone light because if it's really dark, you would see it. Um, and so what I did was, was I, I traced, it's gonna show up well. I traced where my body was in relation to the phone, every single shot, uh, traced it down, brightened that part of the scene up. So then you can actually see that, uh, you know, the phone screen's really bright. And then that just makes it that much more drastic as that's the only like light source in the entire room. Uh, as to be that like a really drastic change from when that turns off and the screen just goes black. Hey, future Steven here. I was editing and uh, speaking about uh, things that were so subtle you might not notice. Um, there was something that was important enough that I legitimately forgot when I was recording it uh, the first time. So let me go back, cover my feet. So the two important parts of the screen to look at are one over down here, keyframes. That's like where the stopping points are. And uh, two is down here, saturation. It starts off at around 51. That's space, this is that, that's standard. And what it does is that when it hits this point, this is the point where they're waiting for each other. Saturation jumps up 
to 60. Vibrancy is heightened. They're happy. They're excited. Um, until it hits the next point where it's that that she leaves the car. So like she knew she knows she's going to be late. She's, she leaves the car and starts running. It's a slight slow drop of saturation where it hits 45. And 45 is at the lowest point, the lowest low. So the point that they're staring down at their phones in the dark and they go back to, the, to school uh, at the lockers. And so like saturation. And this point on, you get saturation very quickly in a very short amount of time, increase back up to here at this end point, uh, back up to 60 saturation. It goes from, from the stole 45 saturation all the way up to 60. And you can see if I jump back and forth from these two, which are one continuous scene, I uh, clearly see more saturation in the, in, the, in the latter part, showing that their relationship goes from like a sad note very, very quickly to a happy note. So, so yeah, it's very slow. It's very subtle change throughout this, throughout the entire video. But uh, yeah, it uh, adds a very strong effect, uh, subconscious effect, even if you don't realize it, like I did. <laughs> so yeah, back to the end. So that was everything I did in post-processing to make one more step. If you guys enjoyed, if you guys learned something, if you guys now understand how much work goes into making a video, even if it's only 10 minutes long, um, a lot of stuff goes into it. And uh, glad you guys really liked the video. You haven't seen it yet, or maybe if you want to rewatch it after knowing all this, the secret tips and tricks that I had to use to get where it is today, maybe you know, feel free to go rewatch it. A uh, bunch of other kind of scenes you skipped around. Uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. This is Stephen Ng, and see you guys next time. Yeah.